The Melting Pot. Hosted by Dominic Monkhouse. Hello and welcome to The Melting Pot. This is Dominic Monkhouse, your host. Today I'm talking to Nick Earl. He used to run the internet for HP. He then ran the cloud for Cisco. Then he was in charge of business development for Elon Musk's Hyperloop. And now he's changing lives in Africa through mobile microcredit. Nick talks at length about his experience with Hyperloop, how it'll actually work, how he feels it's turning trains into a packet switching network. And he reflects on a life well spent. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Nick Earl. My name is Nick Earl, and I've had a uh, 35 year career. Uh, probably a bit longer, actually. And I've been essentially in technology all my life. Quick snapshot, computer science degree, um, when it wasn't even called computing, it was called computational and statistical science. So we just used computers to solve maths problems. So I got in the very early days of computing, did 17 years at HP, ended up running global marketing for HP and the internet incubator with a VC fund, did two startups in between, uh, Ariba and a Swedish uh, software company both got sold. Um, then 13 years at Cisco, ran the global field services business, which is about $11 billion of, um, of Cisco, all the maintenance and the consultancy, and then ran the cloud business for Cisco for two years, cloud and managed services. And then um, complete career change, went to run all go-to-market for Virgin Hyperloop One. So started to uh, build the next generation transportation system that would, for instance, go between London and Edinburgh in uh, an hour. I recently did a TED talk on that, TEDx in Glasgow. And now I'm uh, chairman and CEO of a, an IoT startup in Guildford, working with Amazon Web Services on uh, IoT. So Pretty, uh, pretty broad career and still plugging away and now in my third startup. And maybe the most exciting stuff still to come. <laughs> Who knows? My wife keeps on telling me to uh, not retire and, and, uh, and go out and get another job. So who knows? But yeah, um, I, uh, I don't think I'll uh, uh, retire and grow carrots um, all, all day long uh, anytime soon, but uh, although I'd like to. But yeah, I mean, I find every job is, is just fascinating and, and particularly the last couple of ones, you know, creating a new mode of transport that, I mean, for instance, let me just, you know, straight away give an example of what Hyperloop could do. And this was in the TED talk. The, you know, there's a road between Mumbai and Pune in India that takes three hours to drive. And amazingly, millions of people drive it and then drive back every day. So they're spending six hours in the car just to earn a living. <laughs> And, you know, there is a project underway in India to build a hyperloop uh, between those two cities. And it will reduce the each way journey time to um, 25 minutes. So basically, you're going to give five hours a day back to millions of Indians. It's going to change their lives. Um, They're going to either, you know, get back earlier so they can see the family or see the kids before they go to bed. Or they're just going to work more hours so they can, you know, feed the family. And so that's pretty cool. And we're doing similar things at the IoT company here, which is called SI, E-S-E-Y-E. Um, you know, we're putting water pumps in in villages in Africa that people can use microcredit. You know, for a few pence a week, we're delivering fresh water to millions of Africans being able to use a, a phone in the village and um, install a pump so that they can actually pay for an, a, a, essentially a water installation in their village for the very first time, saving them an hour and a half journey with a with a with some buckets or a jug on their head each way to the uh, nearest well. So, yeah, in the latter part of my career, I've sort of gone into things which are actually making a difference in the world as opposed to the first part of my career, which was, you know, standard corporates that perhaps weren't as exciting. Um, but at this stage of my career, it seems like the things that change people's lives are the things that appeal to me more and more. Fascinating, Nick. Uh, the the Hyperloop stuff. It, so the project in India actually being built rather than just being talked about. Yeah. Um, so there's various stages of a, a project. 
and I learned this when I uh, when I came on board because I'd never worked in transport. I mean, I thought transport was really really boring, and um, it was those you know people who stood on the end of platforms at railway stations and wrote down numbers in notebooks with anoraks. And what I actually suddenly realised is that transport was a trillion dollar TAM, four times bigger than the global IT market. And the reason is that it's the last area of our lives that hasn't digitized. It's completely analog. I mean, you know, it's paper tickets. There's no information on the train. The trains are terrible and they're getting worse, certainly as we know in the UK. It's, you know, it's on the front page of the newspaper every day how bad our trains are and how they're getting worse. And we're spending about 5% of our lives traveling. Um, so when I saw Hyperloop, my immediate reaction was, oh, you know, it's just a fast train. And then I realized, having been in IT all my life, that actually it's not a train it's actually a physical version of the internet uh, you know it's packet switching so the ca- you know the carriages are called pods you, you order them on your phone on demand you sit inside them you could be a person or a freight and it, they go direct to destination so the topology is more like a, a motorway where if the car in front of you peels off uh, to go to leave at the next exit you don't have to follow them which you do with the train so every every packet or every pod goes direct to destination. It's basically uh, uh, IP packet switching, uh, but using um, atoms uh, instead of bits. And I suddenly realized, oh my God, it, 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 Hyperloop is, it, it, yeah, the headline is speed, it's fast. You know, it would go, you know, London to, um, let's say, Sheffield in 20 minutes, as opposed to HS2, which will knock 20 minutes off the journey from London to Sheffield and it'll do that for half the price uh, and 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 so it, it's but the next the world's gr- next great network it, it's just a physical network and trains are 200 years old the steel wheels on steel rails was invented in the 1820s so in India they um, they've got this massive problem with transport and they're going to leapfrog like they did for 4G you know you get a better 4G single in M- Mumbai than you do in London because they leapfrogged um, and uh, the, when I was with the chief minister of Maharashtra State, who signed the deal with me, 112 million people, he's like the prime minister. He, you know, he says, you know, we're, Mr. Earl, he says, we're going to leapfrog and we're going to put it in before your home country will do. And he's absolutely right. And, you know, we're going to live five hours a day back to people and give uh, Maharashtra, Mumbai Pune, and the new airport there in the port the most advanced transportation system in the world. And these guys are understand leapfrog and they understand the role technology plays in national competitiveness and GDP creation. So it's fascinating the attitude they have in emerging markets. And so, yeah, it's going to happen. The project is at the um, uh, 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 advanced engineering study phase. And the goal is um, by 2022, you'll have the first 10 kilometers of it. Um, established and uh, that's where they do the final testing and the safety certificate and then they do the full build out so the goal is within five years from today hopefully four years from today there'll be a working hyperloop in india and that's one of several projects around the world but probably the one that will in my view likely to be the first above ground and and when you talk about a pod with that in the indian example is that am i am i thinking about a car or a train carriage okay, or so so visually, if you want to know what a, a pod looks like, imagine a small jet aircraft, but take the wings mm. off and the wheels off, <laughs> just the fuselage, that's a pod. Okay, so it's okay. It between 12 and 16 people. goes inside a tube. Uh, we take most of the air out of the tube, uh, equivalent, so it's equivalent to the air pressure at 220,000 feet. You propel it with, forward with a linear motor. A linear motor is like an ordinary electric motor. Instead of it going round and round and round, it goes forward gets to 25 kilometers miles an hour it lifts so it's wheels to begin with then it lifts levitates at 25 uh, miles an hour um, at which point the, the electromagnetic system inside the pod which is going uh, being adjusted 4,000 times a second holds it in place and you keep to you keep accelerating it until you get to the speed you want so let's say in Mumbai Pune it would be about 600 miles an hour and then you turn all power off and basically, because there's almost no air in the tube, it's uh, 99.99% vacuum, it glides then like a spaceship. And then when it slows down, it regenerates electricity like a Tesla, uh, settles down on, it, on its wheels when it gets really slow, and it stops. 
So um, as people say, will your face peel off on a Hyperloop? <laughs> no, it won't because I, you know, airplanes accelerate at 0.25 G, go to about 500, 600 miles an hour, slow down and stop. Your face doesn't peel off on an airplane. Uh, the only difference is this one, uh, uh, we bring the sky down to the ground rather than have to go up in the sky to get less pressure. Above ground, below ground, doesn't make any difference. The only difference is below ground, it's uh, tunneling costs. Um, mm -hmm. It's about the same width as the London Underground. In the case of Mumbai Pune, um, about 30% would be tunneled and 70% of it would be above ground. But countries like the UK, if we ever uh, you know, got a rack together and did this, uh, that's a government issue, probably be tunneled all the way. Nobody wants a big shiny tube running through our crowded cities. But it, the Hyperloop technology doesn't care whether it's above or below ground. You've mentioned HS2 there. Do you think we've do you think we've missed an opportunity, or is it is it just the decision to do something was taken so long ago and vested interests are so entrenched that changing it now would be difficult? I think it's both. So first of all, if you look at HS2, I personally believe that it's the world's last great legacy transport project. As I said, you know the the, the estimated costs are about sixty seven, sixty eight billion pounds right now. There's, that excludes the thirty percent contingency overrun so if you look at it um, and it's still about 17 years away so if you look at it you have to assume this is going to be a 100 billion pound project now you know I'm speaking here as a, in a personal capacity as a UK taxpayer from a technology point of view it's steel wheels on steel rails the point about a train is that trains leave according to a timetable I know this sounds obvious but HS2 to me is, is, is like spending money on the post office to deliver letters quicker when the internet is, is just being released. The train's uh, timetable, the carriages are physically connected together and if there are 10 stops on the line and you're going to the end of the line, you have to stop 10 times. Uh, you know, high-speed trains are not high-speed if they keep on having to stop. They're also very expensive. You know, you have to, you know, 30% of the cost of putting a railway system in is acquiring the land and moving the utilities. And of course, you have the uh, human cost of plowing through villages along the way. The fact is that, um, you know, back to the Indian example, you know, we're talking about something which is probably half the cost. And I'm talking total cost of ownership here, CapEx and OpEx, over a 30 year period. Um, it is significantly quicker. You know the timings for the Indian project, and there's Middle East projects as well. Um, and the fact is, it's it, it's just a better system. It's it's not the speed of Hyperloop that makes it a better system. It's the fact that it's an on-demand, order it through your phone. It leaves when you're ready. It doesn't stop. It goes direct to destination. And it, it's you know it's it's the internet. It's a digital. It's it, it half the technology is 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 digital. So it's going to get cheaper and cheaper over time. And you then have a series of services that you can layer on top, like, like you know, half the technology in an iPhone is, is iOS, which delivers the experience. It's not the physical phone that delivers the experience. It's the iOS and the application platform. It'd be exactly the same um, with Hyperloop. You do multimodal travel. So I was recently uh, in Australia. I did a speech with the people who run Uber Elevate. That's the, um, you know, the helicopters. And, you know, Uber mm. Elevate will do um, uh, things within cities. So my own view as, a, as an IT guy is if you look at the history of how networks evolve, they always come, and I use the internet as an example, they always come down to a three-layer topology. You have in the internet, as we know, wide area networks, fiber between cities. You have local area networks. So you have you know, uh, ethernet cable around a, uh, a district or within a building. And then you have ubiquitous access last mile, which in the case of the internet is Wi-Fi. So you know, three-layer topology that we're very useful to. And then packetization of all the packets, interoperability between the different networks and a set of open standards governed by an independent body. Put those ingredients together and you then change business processes. You change the world. By the way, the packets move quickly, but that's not the point about the internet. I think where we are now with transport is into the packets move quickly debate. Uh, but what you'll rapidly see is that you, because you order this through your smartphone, you'll, order, you'll say, look, I want to go from London to, I don't know, uh, Leeds. And when I'm in Leeds, I want to go to Bradford. And you'll order that as one, and it could be a Hyperloop, which is the wide area network. Um, well, first of all, it could be a um, it could be an autonomous car, an Uber, say, that takes you to the Hyperloop portal in London. 
Then you have the Hyperloop, the wide area network. Then you get get off at the other end, and maybe you have a Uber Elevate, um, or if you're a parcel, it could be a drone. And so you'll have a three-layer topology. The ubiquitous access, the first mile, last mile, will be autonomous cars and drones. The local area network, or layer two, will be some of these new things that are uh, coming, such as what Elon Musk is doing with the Boring Company, digging you know, uh, lower speed vehicles that are more suited to a metro area, and uh, also uh, autonomous cars within a city. And then the the wide area network, or the you know up to a thousand kilometres, will be things like the system that the Virgin Hyperloop One are uh, building. And you'll have interoperability between all three, a consistent customer experience through a mobile phone, an on-demand system, no timetable, and multimodal travel. Uh, you know, door to door like never before. You know, you could deliver freight, for instance, across North America the same day, same day delivery of freight, same day delivery of freight across. India. So just like the internet transformed business processes, uh, but at first we thought it was just a, a cool way of downloading a film quicker. Now we say, no, 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 it, it, it disrupts entire industries. Then I believe transport is the next IT. And what's happening now with all this innovation in transport is going to be um, disruption of uh, business processes like supply chain enabled by autonomous digital transport and i think that's in 10 20 years time what we'll look we we will look back and say that's what happened thank god about time because we're all spending hours a day years of our life in decrepit de decrepit old fashioned transport systems that have reached the point of no return in that the more you spend on them the smaller return you get and it would appear that in the case of our uh, train systems the evidence suggests that we're now getting we're getting uh, they are declining no matter how much money we spend on them uh, the experience is getting worse and worse and worse because essentially they're 200 year old analog systems <laughs> nick i was i was struck as you were describing the future with last year's industrial action on southern rail where the rail union were suggesting that it was unsafe to not have Bizarre. human beings opening the doors. And, and, here, and here we are talking about it's, completely autonomous travel. It, it, it's quaint, isn't it? it? It's sort of like saying, you know, should we actually tell people to write with blue ink, not black ink on parchment in order for the uh, letter to be able to be read? It, it, it's, it, it's, it's not what we should be talking about. But I think it is changing. Everywhere you look, there's innovation um, in transport. Mm -hmm. And um, when you have a trillion dollar TAM and a 200 year old system at its core, you're going to get innovation. And so I just think that's what's happening now. What other area of our life has been completely immune to digitization other than transport? I mean, it, it is appalling, isn't it? You know, it's paper tickets and train, you know, inspector comes and punches a hole in it with a little bit of metal he takes out of his pocket. I mean, it's. It's sort of Mr. Darcy stuff, isn't it? You know, and then, you know, when you're on the train, if you want to know where you are, well, you can look out the window. Hopefully you recognize something or you get your phone out and see if you've got a Wi-Fi signal, which has got about a one in five chance. So you can perhaps, you know, or a cell, a cell phone signal better. So, you know, maybe you can use Google Maps to find out where you are. Um, I, you know, it's, it's awful. Um, and it clearly you can improve it incrementally. You can put a faster engine on the front. Um, you can make the trains lean over a little bit so they go faster around curves. But, you know, if George Stevenson came back to life and um, went to uh, Houston, I've got to believe he'd, he'd say, well, this is great. I recognize that. That's a train. Kind of the last area of our life where that's the case. So, of course, it's going to happen. People will say, you know, most common thing is when something new like this happens, people say, oh, you know, it's, it's not proven. It, it, it's not safe, you know, it, it, we've seen this before, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, the first one's true, it's not proven, um, but everything's not proven until it is. Is it safe? Well, the number one reason for train accidents is uh, actually uh, the interaction between, well, A, the, the person, you mentioned the guard, people cause more accidents than, um, same with airplanes, 90% of all accidents are caused by the humans. 
people if it's autonomous, but it's also the interaction between the train and the human. So railway crossings are the number one area for train accidents. And of course, um, with Hyperloop uh, being multimodal and in a tube, it, it doesn't have to go whizzing across, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the local road with red lights and a barrier. So, so you know, it, it inherently, if you look at the, the top five reasons why we have transport accidents, none of them exist from a design perspective um, in, in the new modes of travel that we're creating. Now, there'll be other risks, of course. Um, but um, it, it there's always um, you know skeptics, and I think back to your question. Once you get momentum behind major projects, it's really hard to change course. It's like a ship. But I think that for the UK, there are things that we could do. For instance, now we've got the third runway to Heathrow, we could actually have you know remote areas that would allow traffic to come in without having to drive to Heathrow. You could uh, have sites out in, uh, for instance, Newbury, as an example, or north north of Heathrow, where people could par- park and ride and come in on a two-minute connection. And, you know, you could come in uh, under under the Heathrow, like the Virgin car, if you fly Virgin upper class. They check you in in the car, and you don't go to the front of Terminal 3 at Heathrow. You go around the back, and they give you your ticket, and you actually go straight in, and you go to the lounge. Um, so, you know, we could actually uh, bring people in from remote locations and, st- and that would has a tremendous effect on the uh, lack of pollution and the reduction in the number of cars that would crowd the M4 corridor with the Heathrow Airport expansion. So it doesn't have to be HS2 head to head. I think that's got its own momentum and, you know, it will it will live live or not on, on its own momentum. But, but um, I think there are lots of other uh, different areas that we could do linking airports together. With, with a few minutes transfer time, um, uh, remote check-in into airports are, are just some examples of business processes, in this case airports, that could be uh, transformed through uh, this new technology. Nick, just in terms of the how it actually works, you've got, having one tube would still, I suppose, be the limit, is that you've still got the limitation of like having one track. So I yeah, suppose, it, you need to have... You need to have at least two tubes, otherwise you can't yeah, be going up and down. Two, otherwise, yeah, you need to have at least two because the pods go one way in one tube and they go, it's like the channel tunnel, right? And yeah. And um, the pods don't swerve around each other. But it, but by convoying, uh, you can actually get some pretty high volumes on the tube. So the, the Mumbai Pune is 130 million passenger journeys per year, uh, rising to 150 million um, over the next few years, that's one tube out, one tube back, and um, so you peel. It's, it, the, as I say, the t- topology is like a, a motorway. You're all you're mm-hmm. going up a motorway. You're driving fast. The car in front of you pulls off uh, on the slip road. You carry on going. Um, so think of it like that. And um, so there's electromagnetic switching, which allows the pods to switch into a side tube and peel off. Uh, okay. Um, so my other question was because you were talking about sort of Newbury Heathrow, there must be a minimum distance. Because if you've got to accelerate up to 600 miles an hour and then decelerate at the other end, there's, you know, if you're traveling for 600 miles an hour for any sense of, you know, a, a reasonable distance, then you get this massive reduction. If you're accelerating up and then decelerating down, there must yeah. be a sort of, unless you're going to do it over X, you don't Yeah, you don't yeah, get the minimum, I mean, really, movement. first of all, it doesn't have to go at 650 mile an hour. It can go at 150 mile an hour. Uh, you still get the benefits of packetization. Remember, networks yeah. move at different speeds. Uh, fiber is much faster than than uh, Wi-Fi. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, the sweet spot uh, for a Hyperloop is probably 40 miles uh, upwards, and probably okay. upper limit um, seven, eight hundred miles. And the reason is after that, at the upper limit. Um, the construction costs outweigh uh, air, air travel wins, um, but uh, and below 40k, uh, yeah, you you don't get the benefits of it, and there's typically an existing form of public transport, which is uh, cheaper. And and you you say you've got the, there are also some projects that are underway, although in in the Middle East, although you think India will be first, where think, where in the Middle East are people? Yeah, they've had quite a bit of uh, publicity. The um, Dubai linking Dubai and Abu Dhabi is is under serious consideration. In fact, there is a 
pod that we've built for the uh, RTA, which is the Road Transport Authority in Dubai. Um, and um, the uh, also there's a lot of interest in connecting the airports. They're building a whole new airport in Dubai. And of course, if you can bring people into the airport where they check in in the pod, and you can take them direct to the satellite that they're going from, then you don't need car parks at the airport. You don't need as many check-in desks as the airport. You don't need as much security at the airport. And people don't have to walk as far from check-in to the gate, which is a big issue in big airports. Mm. Um, and so you can actually build a smaller airport. Well, if you build a smaller airport with tunnels underneath it, that, that, you know, hyperloop tunnels that go direct to the satellites, the, the capex saving on uh, airport construction would pay many times over for the, um, the Hyperloop downtown connection or, or connection between the two airports for an airside, secure airside connection. So there's um, lots of interest there. There's been early interest in Saudi Arabia and in the US. There's about three states now where there are early projects um, in in the US for um, for uh, Hyperloop projects. Again, you know, all, all of this is publicly uh, available and you know it, it's the as, you know in the, in the Gartner technology adoption curve it, it's the early innovators people yeah. who say you know what, I'm going to give it a go and then we have to uh, prove it uh, prove that it works uh, get the security certificates and then you get mass adoption the, the interesting thing is though I get asked a lot I got asked this um, recently in Australia and at the TED talk why is it that emerging markets are more advanced than established markets and well, first of all, they are, they got more of a problem. And secondly, therefore, they, you know, they, they want it. The benefits are bigger. They, they, they actually see the correlation, as I said, between innovation and national competitiveness. But the third reason is that, and most people don't appreciate this, is the job creation. And the way I like to describe this is that, you know, when I, uh, when I worked for HP, I, you know, I was lucky enough to go over to Silicon Valley and be part of the HP management team over there. And I, we went out there and I uh, uh, went out there in 97, early 97. I remember meeting my neighbor who lived there for about 40 years. And I said, oh, it's so cool to, to come from, you know, London, go and work in Silicon Valley. And he, he said, son, he said, you know, it's interesting you guys call it Silicon Valley. Those people who lived here, we call it, for us, it's still the fruit capital of California. Because remember, before it was Silicon Valley, it was where the peaches and the oranges were grown. And there's hardly any of them left, those orchards. But the point was that when you had something new, which was, in this case, IT, Intel with the 8086, the silicon chip, an ecosystem was created. And once the ecosystem was there, it sort of it reinforced itself. And although you went through several ways, you know, we went from microprocessor design, instrumentation design, mini computers, you know, software companies, cloud companies, AI companies, the point is that the Silicon Valley stayed in the same place, and then Stanford got involved. Where this is the place to go, where you uh, would learn about technology in universities and the students. It all self-reinforces. Well, you know, if 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 I'm right that tech, that transport is the next IT, in my analogy, uh, the physical internet, then there's going to be thousands and thousands of jobs. There's not going to be hyperloop factories. Uh, and centers of university centers of expertise in every country in the world. So the Indians in this case and the, and the people in the Middle East uh, absolutely get that. I mean, in the case of Middle East, they have to wean themselves off the dependency of oil and they have a very high percentage of people under the age of 25. So for them, the job opportunities, especially for India, um, you know, uh, Premier Modi's make in India strategy, you know, the, 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 this, there's, 20 to 30,000 jobs that could be created through Hyperloop. And I'm not talking about construction jobs that go away once it's been built. I'm talking about high-tech jobs in the same way as, you know, Boeing doesn't have air, airplane factories in every country in the world. So, you know, if you study how industries start and how they cluster, um, then mm. what will happen is the jobs then create export, exportable expertise that then sustain the economy for many years to come. Of course, it's a gamble, but if if Hyperloop does indeed become the next mode of transportation, I, and you know, in my view, it will do. It's just a question of when, not if. Uh, but but you know, 50 years time, are we still going to be doing steel wheels on steel rails? I don't think so. Then um, there will be high tech clusters around the world, 
and university clusters around the world where these jobs are. And again, speaking as a UK citizen and taxpayer, you know, the country that invented the train <laughs> and the hovercraft and the jet engine and a whole bunch of things, it would be a shame if we missed out. It's not just about fast transportation. It's not just about whether HS2 is the right thing or not. And those trains for HS2 are not made in the UK. Um, it, it, it's about uh, our manufacturing and our technology future. And uh, do we want to, uh, you know, we, we missed out on IT. And are we going to miss out on, on, on something else which could be as big, potentially bigger, because this is a trillion dollar total addressable market transportation. And so from, from changing the world's transportation dreams, the new business or the business that you're now involved in, yeah. you spoke very briefly about the, the wells, but there's some, there's some other great projects that they've been involved in as well, haven't they? And, and perhaps you could tell, tell me a little bit more about what you're doing there well, and how this is going to change the world. <laughs> I don't know whether... Well, yeah, I mean, obviously I quite like BHAGs, Big Hairy, big hairy or Audacious Goals. So I moved on from Virgin Hyperloop 1 because created, I used to joke that my job was, was, to, was to sell something for a few billion dollars to um, very conservative governments who actually didn't want to buy it and, and, and were not sure whether it would ever work. <laughs> so that was sort of my job description as the head of uh, global business development uh, for uh, Virgin Hyperloop 1. Uh, but, but having secured a pipeline of projects, the emphasis is then on implementation, not building up the pipeline. So it was like, okay, I've done that. What should I do? Thought about retirement. My wife quickly corrected me that that wasn't an option. So uh, here I am now. I'm actually speaking to you from uh, Guildford. Uh, I'm chairman and CEO of a company called SIESEYE. But what they do is um, essentially, quick explanation, you put a SIM card in a phone, it connects to one network. You know, Vodafone SIM card connects to Vodafone. Uh, I know we all know that. It can roam onto a few other networks, but essentially it's loyal to Vodafone. What SI have is their own SIM, which actually can go to 440 networks. So basically, you put a SIM in an IoT device, and wherever you send the device around the world, it will connect to the network. And that, that's a pretty big deal. But the other thing that it does is it will automatically register onto um, Amazon Web Services. So what this thing will do is it actually means that if you want to do an IoT strategy, you actually can do it as a user rather than an IT person. And so we talked about, you know, the water example of if Africa, you know, an African villager can implement IoT in the village um, by connecting to whatever network is available, whatever village they're in. And there's a lot of networks, in, uh, very fragmented in Africa, so the 440 networks thing works quite well. And by just by taking a photograph of a QR code with their phone, it does all, all the setup on uh, Amazon Web Services. And basically, they pay with microcredit on their phone uh, and get water. Uh, the other thing, that, that, as another example, is, is most people haven't got electricity. So, but they've got lots of sunshine. So another company makes a, called M. Copa makes a solar lantern which is a little thing, it arrives in a box, and they you know, take it out, they unfold a solar panel, and they plug the cable in, and basically uh, they get, they get um, uh, light. First time in their life, they get light when it's dark. And again, they, you know, somebody has to pay, it has to be maintained, and it has to connect. Uh, but um, uh, by having the uh, AnyNet, as it's called, the Any Network, AnyNet SIM in it, uh, it, it does all the registration, all the back end, and they, it, you know you can pay through the phone. And so there's loads and loads of examples of uh, this. And it doesn't just have to be emerging markets. Uh, I was looking at one the other day, which is um, uh, Brazil. There's lots and lots of different uh, phone networks in Brazil. And somebody told me, I'm going to see it shortly, but that if you pay, go to a restaurant, you order a meal in Brazil. The guy there will have five uh, payment card machines. And he'll basically, because uh, the networks are so unreliable, they'll try machine number one. If it doesn't work, oh, 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 let's try this machine. It's not like in the UK, sorry, sir, your card doesn't work. Have you got another card? Over there, it's the machine doesn't work. And they basically are constantly moving around with five card machines because the, the, the signals are going in and out all the time. 
they only get an average of about 60% connectivity. Well, you know, with the SIM card in, that goes to 100%. So it, it you know, it, it pays for itself. So uh, what I'm now looking to see is what are the business opportunities? If you could have ubiquitous connectivity over cellular anywhere in the world, um, what sort of, combine that with things like micro payments, uh, what, services could you deliver to people? I used a corporate example and I used an African example, but there's large parts of the world, Asia, um, where uh, the benefits of the IT revolution that we've um, all experienced for the last 30 years have just not been available to these people. It's unthinkable. They don't even have the power. Uh, They don't have electricity, but mobile phone prices have dropped tremendously. Uh, and so you you do see an awful lot of people with, and it could be just 2G, but that's okay. Uh, you, have, you see an awful lot of people with cheap mobile phones, with cheap calling plans. And so there are a tremendous number of um, uh, businesses now being set up with grants that actually saying, you know, how could you transform people's lives to deliver healthcare services, fresh water, um, uh, electricity, lighting, to these places or or conservation, you know, early notification of, you know, rhinos getting poached or or whatever. Uh, There's a tremendous number of things you can do uh, once connectivity uh, is ubiquitous. And so it's not that different to Hyperloop in the sense of ubiquitous connectivity of uh, physical transport, ubiquitous connectivity of digital services. And I think that we're at a very exciting time in our in our lives to be able to actually uh, work on projects that change people's lives in this way. I was just thinking about light in, light in Africa, and I guess you know, it has an impact on schooling. People can do homework, That's girls right. can go to school. You know, there's just, it, it's, it changes lives in more than it just does. Uh, you know, illumination. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it, it, it does. I mean, you know, who is it that's carrying those water jugs an hour and a half uh, there and back each day? It's probably, you know, it's probably the mothers. And then when the girl's old enough to uh, carry the water, you know, she doesn't go to school because her job is to get the water. Because if you don't drink water, you, you, you die. So it's just not, you, know, you prioritize it. But if you can actually do something like this and then um, and then you have the solar lantern, and um, there's lots of companies trying to bring, you know, education, especially for, for girls. It's a really key opportunity. And, uh, you know, uh, education is the single biggest thing that we can do to create a new middle class and to create peace in the world. It's been proven that, that you, know, the, 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 you know, to stop, you know, wars, disputes, um, to raise people's living standards. The number one thing you need to do is education. If you then provide clean water and basic facilities like light, um, you have a tremendous effect. Now, once you've got an, a connection to people, you can deliver content. So, you know, the Solar Lantern, once they've proven, you know, the credit thing with Paygo micropayments, you can then start to deliver content and services into these villages. So you, you're then setting people up to run small businesses, but they're running small businesses inside their village. So you're actually creating entrepreneurs. And so it's a very exciting uh, thing. It, it's very difficult. I mean, you know, things we take for granted clearly don't exist. So you, know, you have to work with local companies who know the reality of, of doing things. And prices have to be almost beyond a point where they would work in the Western world. But the, uh, you know, the take-up for people, as you say, if you deliver fresh water and light to a village that is two hours walk away from somewhere from the nearest large village of course you're going to change people's lives and we should be doing this that we should be giving back in this way nick if i could take you back to your certainly to cisco at least your earlier your earlier career what what is it that you learned there or maybe it is earlier than cisco what 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 is it that you that you learn what what lessons are you still getting value from every day in, in your, your new work with, with Hyperloop and uh, yeah, IoT? I, I think, well, first of all, I've learned, <laughs> I've learned a lot of what not to do. Um, I could probably, <laughs> I've done two books. I could probably do a third one on, on all the mistakes I've made. But I think one of the, uh, when I do coaching or mentoring, you know, we've got two girls and 
I try my best to coach and mentor them. Or if I coach and mentor, I give speeches, what I often do to young people. I gave one at the National Geographic Society recently to about 300 kids and their parents. That was fascinating. The kids asked the best questions on, you know, what advice um, would you give? And a lot of people in, in the industry get asked to do these things. You know, I had to think about, you know, what do, what do I tell them? Because the world that they're growing up in is very, very different to the world um, you know, I've, I've, I've grown up in. But one thing I, uh, I guess I always did if I look back is I always had curiosity. I, I always asked lots of questions and challenged things. And if I look back on the sorts of jobs that I got, you know, I, I talked about I was running the internet incubator for Carly Fiorina when she was CEO of HP. The reason I got that is I kept on saying, why is Sun Microsystems kicking HP's butt? Why is Scott McNeely the dot in dot com? And HP was sort of, you know, the biggest company in Silicon Valley, but, you know, it was famous for inkjet printers. Why, why can't we also be an internet company? And, you know, it's not that difficult. And it, eventually it was a guy, you know, stop going on about it. If, 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 you, if you feel so strongly about it, start a business inside this company, start the incubator. That's actually how I ended up with the cloud job at Cisco. I was I was saying, you know, Amazon Web Services is going to kill Cisco because it's not it's the first time in Cisco's history that they've not competed with someone with a bit, with a better product because their traditional way of responding to that was buy the company. They bought 180 plus companies, but they actually came up with a, a philosophical attack which is you don't need computers or boxes you connect to it. You know, it, 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 they'd never seen a competitor who came at them with a philosophical uh, attack as opposed to a better mousetrap. And so eventually mm. it was, you know, th this thing's going to kill us unless we, unless we turn a router and a, and a switch um, into a service. And one thing led to another and said, well, if you feel that strongly about it, you know, build the team and have a go. And, and that's why I've kind of flipped between big companies and startups, big companies and startups, because whenever I see something, I want to change it. I think, well, it could be better. I want to change it. And so that's what I mean by natural curiosity. And I think I've never planned a career move. I never thought I would get into transport. I didn't think I'd be doing, you know, water. Uh, well, this company's already established I'm in now, but they did the water uh, thing. And we've now got quite a few projects like that so I never thought I would be talking to someone about delivering fresh water in Africa I didn't plan any of these things but I think if people just have a curiosity and think why can't we do that I mean the cost of starting a business now as you know Dom it's it's almost nothing I mean you, with, with, with services like Amazon Web Services and some software coding skills and, a, and an open entrepreneurial mind a, a few pens and a whiteboard in a month or six weeks and maybe three thousand pounds you know capital most of which will go on a laptop you can actually be in business and so it's never been a better time to actually start something and try it now in my case i've never been the founder so i'm i've always worked for people who started companies so i'm i'm not that person i'm sort of the, the person who would scale it but I think that if we question things and we say, and we, we do blue sky thinking, that we start, instead of looking at something that says, how can we make it 5% better, that's, that's incremental thinking. We actually, you know, say, I don't care how it works today. You draw a picture on a whiteboard. What would it, in, if a, in a perfect world, how would it work? And you draw a picture and then say, why can't it work like that? Why can't trains work like the internet? I mean, that's how Hyperloop came about. That's what came out of Elon Musk's head. He wrote the white paper. Why can't trains work like the internet? Uh, and, and actually, when you look at it and think, you know what, they, they, if we did this, that, and that, maybe they could. You know, why can't you use cellular techno technology, a bit of concrete, a tap, um, a, a drill bit, and a, and a SIM card that connect to anything. Why can't you have a system that would be a little mini business delivering fresh water uh, to and light to people in Africa? So I think that we should quite, we have this incredible opportunity as society that we're on the verge of so many things, medicine, 3D printing, artificial intelligence. I was reading 
uh, I saw Click, the BBC program, whether you saw it, that now there's a there's an app on a phone that that can pass a medical degree, you know, with 10% higher mark than the average doctor having, you know, a student trained for five years to be a doctor. Uh, you can deliver, you can now self-diagnose uh, with the app at a higher percentage accuracy than a GP. You know, we stand on the edge of so many incredible breakthroughs that I think that, uh, which is no longer just technology, it's all of our lives, medicine, you know, the, the app could do tremendous things to the NHS. I think looking back, cure, if I had to put it in one word, it's curiosity, well, maybe two words, I'll cheat. Curiosity <laughs> and enthusiasm is like, you know what? Sod it. I'm just going to give it a go. <laughs> we only live once. God. I, I'm, I'm struck that there is a solution out there for me. In former lives, I've spent time selling to GPs. So not just as a consumer of my local GP surgery service, but as a uh, somebody going and visiting lots of GP surgeries. And I'm always struck that the last bastion of awful customer service seems to me oh, the doctor's dreadful. receptionist. So, oh. so, you know, they're, oh, they're it's, dreadful. They're, they're, so, <laughs> they're, they're, uh, it's like dragons at the gate. And my doctors, you have to you have to turn up 45 minutes work, uh, earlier before it opens to queue outside to get in to ask, can you have an appointment on the day? I mean, it's just awful. Um, as you say, I would love, why can't we have telemedicine through, most of the times I, I could easily be diagnosed over Skype than spend three hours to go and see someone to ask me, five questions, give me a piece of paper and send me out to the office. I mean, it could, it could absolutely, with a single patient record, it could absolutely be automated in the cloud. Yes. Oh, well, there's an opportunity, isn't there? That's, uh, Maybe that's, that's the next one. <laughs> yeah. Elon's currently sitting, dreaming up his next white paper to uh, change telemedicine after he's solved the other problems he's solving, like going to Mars. Um, Nick, if people are thinking... Uh, about that sort of curiosity and sod it. What's, uh, is, there, is there a book or books that you've read or you would recommend? Oh, I think there's loads. Should... Um, the one that immediately jumped into mind is Bold, uh, Peter Diamandis. Uh, Bold is a wonderful book. It talks about the difference between linear and exponential, which is really what we've been talking about. Uh, and just, you know, for listeners, in case you're thinking, what on earth are you talking about now? So the way Peter Diamandis, who runs Singularity um, University, there's a fantastic speaker. You know, if you take 30 steps, linear steps, and your steps are a meter, then guess what? You end up 30 meters away. If you take 30 exponential steps, so 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, you circumnavigate the world 16 times. The point, <laughs> the point it's the grains of sand on the chessboard story. So <laughs> the, point is, the point is that, that Moore's law uh, is driving everything that we're talking about. And Moore's law is exponential. So that's why Kodak invented the digital camera and then Kodak were made bankrupt by the digital camera because they thought the digital camera was linear. Turns out it was exponential. So it got twice as good and half as cheap every 18 months. And guess what? It killed Kodak. Um, and they invented the damn thing. <laughs> it's one of the best case studies. So, you know, the train will be killed by the Hyperloop. It's, it's exponential versus uh, linear. So Bold is a really good book. I think The uh, the World is Flat uh, is, of course, a, a seminal book written by you know twice Pulitzer Prize winning journalist talking about emerging markets and the opportunities in emerging markets where innovation is coming from emerging markets back into established markets. Uh, they are just two that I think are uh, good examples of uh, the opportunity that's out there. That, that sort of tends to be the reading list I I give to uh, people, but there's a lot of good stuff on the web now. There's a lot of great blogs and uh, great examples. And if you could go back in time, what would you do differently? Uh, if I could go back in time. <laughs> that, sounded, that sounded like there was a long list. I mean, there's, well, 
you you know you always think oh my god if i don't if only i'd known then what i know now i mean i would have okay well what what is it you know now that you wish you'd known that you'd known then i mean you you, you financially say oh i bought apple shares i would have bought google shares i would have done this i would have done that but actually i don't think i would have done anything differently i know that sounds a bit crazy but i honestly don't i mean i've had a a blast. I, you know, we've we've been all around the world. We've lived in different places. I've had some really cool jobs. You know, I've I've you know run the internet for HP in Silicon Valley and got to meet people there. Uh, you know, all the people who are doing the startups uh, had some amazing stories. I, I I actually let me just perhaps finish with one story as to give you an example of that. Because I, 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 I honestly don't think I'd change anything. So in 1999, I was on a private jet with Jeff Bezos and the reason was because I was president of the internet for HP and I had to fly I had to go to Seattle pick him up and fly him to New York Teterboro airport outside New York to put him on stage with Carly Fiorina who was then CEO of HP because we'd flipped Amazon from Sun Microsystems to HP and Carly wanted to use him as an example of why HP was a cool internet company so Nick take the jet go pick up this guy Jeff Bezos and fly him to New York. So I found myself five hours on a private jet with Jeff Bezos. Sounds like a apocryphal story, but I swear to God it's true. So the question then is, <laughs> what do you ask Jeff Bezos? Because I'm thinking, well, this guy's a bookseller, right? You know, in 1999, he's a he's a bookseller. So I said to him, I asked him a few questions, and I wasn't really getting very far. And, and then I eventually said to him, Jeff, what's your vision for Amazon? And then he said so. Now bear in mind the context of this. This was the days when the, the, the state of the art was the phone, was the Mo- Motorola flip phone. And the technology, the, the web browser was the WAP, you know, the wireless access protocol, the, the uh, clunky little uh, kids would never recognize it now. But it was truly awful. But it was sort of a bit like CFAX for your phone. Anyway, so I said to Jeff, what's your vision for um, Amazon? He said, I'm going to be the largest retailer in the world. I went, well, you mean book retailers? Yeah. He went, no, no, the largest retailer. I said, well, there's only a certain number of books that people will buy. And he said, you don't get me at all, do you? <laughs> no, obviously, I don't. What are you talking about? <laughs> he, said, he said, I'm going to sell everything. Now, this is 1999, 19 years ago. I'm going to sell everything. The only, And then he said something, which I, I still remember. I can see his face now as I'm saying it. He said, the only way they could stop me is to put lead cladding around every store in the world. And I looked at him and thought, you are a complete nut job. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, at which point I probably went, oh, yeah, really? Okay. And probably suggested we get some sleep. <laughs> but if only I'd have been anywhere near as smart as him, I'd have realized that he actually was 20 years ahead of his time. Look at the chaos on the high street. He knew that phones were on exponential, not linear, and that that, that what I call CFAX on the phone would become something. He didn't know what it was, but he knew you'd be able to browse, you know, like the Netscape browser at the time, you'd be able to browse and you'd be able to buy. And he knew that that would come in over the cellular network. And he knew that his logistics and supply chain would be more efficient than stores holding stock in case somebody ever wanted to buy it. So basically he said, today is books, tomorrow is everything. And hence, I'm going to be the largest retailer in the world. And the only way you can stop me is to put lead cladding so you can't get mobile phone signal into the store. I had no idea what he was talking about and thought he was a nut job. Turns out now he's the world's richest man and I'm not. Um, But that's the difference between uh, people like him and people like me. I do what I do, but I've I've never had that sort of vision. And I think, you know, when when I look back, and I think of the opportunity I personally had by taking a risk, by going to California, by saying, I'll run the internet when I didn't know what the hell that meant uh, for HP. <laughs> I've met some amazing people, had amazing experiences. And honestly, Don, when I look back, I don't think I'd change a damn thing. It's been a blast. Nick, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us today. Great. I enjoyed it. All right. Thanks, Nick. Thank you for listening to the Melting Pot podcast. Please, we're now on iTunes. Give us some feedback and on Stitcher and SoundCloud. That'd be fantastic. And sign up to the newsletter over on medium.com slash foundry dash media. You can sign up for the weekly newsletter and read the blog. Till next time. Goodbye. The Melting Pot was hosted.
hosted by Dominic Monkhouse. And you can find out more about Dom on LinkedIn. Just search for Dominic Monkhouse or his companies, Foundry Media or Foundry 51.